To be alive in 80s would have been a glorious thing. It was an era of glamour and revolution where Michael Jackson moonwalked across the screens with Thriller. Star Wars returned with Empire Strikes Back and Han Solo traded his blaster for a whip, becoming every adventurer's hero as Indiana Jones. Music didn't just change, it exploded when MTV launched. And fashion, it was louder, bolder, unapologetically daring. Power suits, neon colors, styles so bright, they practically lit up the night. And motorsport, it was its own theater of insanity. Fearless drivers raced Group B rally cars on bumpy tracks of Finland and twisted roads of Monte Carlo, showing the world new ways to chase danger and glory. And on the Grand Prix circuits of the world, Formula 1 was setting itself on the pinnacle of motorsport. It was attracting celebrities and becoming a playground for the rich and famous. And just like that, F1 had its own little Hollywood. Cars were not only getting faster, but were glued to the ground like never before. Teams got smarter, pouring in money to innovate wilder machines. All to chase those precious tenths of a second that could decide championship. But it had never been this way. Just a decade ago in 70s, the car used to be tall and boxy with spoilers. They looked fast, but they did not cling to the tracks like the modern machines of today. Drivers fought with cars as much as they fought with each other. The air did not help, it just got in the way. One innovation, just one. That's all it took to change the Formula 1 forever. Someone discovered how to make the very ground beneath the car a tool and the motorsport transformed overnight. It was one ambitious team, driven by a single obsession, the hunger to create engineering masterpieces. Whenever they rolled into the paddock, other teams knew that the game was about to change and they better catch up or be left behind in the history. They were Lotus. Lotus had a habit of looking at problems differently. Where others added more power and brute force, they found brilliance in simplicity, in daring ideas that suggest what a race car could be. In the 80s, they brought the Type 88 to life with such extraordinary engineering that led to its untimely demise. Let's go back to the time when it all started. It was 1977 when Colin Chapman and its team unveiled the Type 78, the first F1 car to really use ground effect concept. They shaped the bottom of the car like an upside down wing and added side skirts to trap the air underneath. This pulled the car down onto the track and gave it more grip. The idea was new and not everything worked perfectly, but within a year, they improved it. And with Type 79, they dominated the 1978 championship which led to rival teams feeling like they were living in the Stone Age. The clever idea born in a cluttered workshop soon became a necessity and every team followed. The cars were so glued down, so blisteringly fast, that what once was a revolutionary concept had now become as common as dirt. But all that speed came with a price. A slightest bump and the car could lose all grip in blink of an eye. While all of this was happening, FIA was keeping tabs on every engineering trick and cross-checking innovations against safety regulations. Meanwhile, Chapman began developing a new car, the Type 80. If ground effect worked this well, he thought, why not go all in? What if the car could generate all its downforce through the underbody, eliminating the need for front and rear wings altogether? On paper, it was brilliant. The Type 80 nearly produced double the downforce of its predecessor. But on track, it was a disaster. At high speeds, the car would bottom out and experience a bouncing effect. They did not know what to call this phenomenon back then, so they simply said the car was unpredictable and dangerous. After just three races, Lotus returned to Type 79 for the rest of the championship. Chapman didn't stop. He kept chasing the perfect machine. While the Type 81 was rolled out for a show in 1980, it was more of a placeholder. Behind closed doors, his team was still developing ground effect and secretly working on a prototype, the Type 86. It was never meant to race, rather created to test a new idea, separating chassis from downforce. 
but the FIA had seen where this was going. It had become a cat and mouse chase, Lotus pushing boundaries and the FIA tightening the rule book in response. Under the banner of safety, they struck back. To protect the drivers and also to keep the championships more competitive, they imposed stricter regulations. Any movable aerodynamic devices including sliding skirts were banned from 1981 and a minimum ride height of 6 cm was introduced. To keep airflow stable, team resorted to softer suspensions and more aggressive tunnels to maintain ground effect. The result? Every car was now low and unstable. Ironically, in trying to tame the downforce of the ground effect, FIA did not just make the cars slow. They accidentally created a brand new problem. The cars started to bounce at high speed making it difficult to drive. The same behavior which was seen in Lotus Type 80 was suddenly visible across the grid. Back then, we did not have a name for it, but today, we call it porpoising. It was a nightmare born in the early 80s, one they thought it had left behind until four decades later when F1 brought ground effect back in 2022 and the same ghost returned to haunt them all over again. And Lotus, in trying to solve it, might have created a path the sport was too afraid to follow. It was the final gamble of a genius who never played safe. Lotus did not stop until they found a way through the regulations. The rules stated that any part of the car influencing its aerodynamics could not move in relation to the vehicle and had to be rigidly secured to the entire sprung part of the car. Basically, the main body must be held up by the suspension. But, entirely sprung part of the car was a grey area, left hanging without a clear definition. And, it was a eureka moment. The Type 86 was a success which led to the creation of Type 88. Tiptoeing right through the grey areas of the rulebook, Chapman and his team introduced twin chassis technology and created a masterpiece to overcome porpoising and butcher the championships. The concept was simple yet brilliant. It featured an inner structure that cradled the driver, sprung softly to smooth out bumps and keep the ride calm. Wrapped around it was a stiffer outer chassis pulling the car down with monstrous ground effect. It was like wearing cushioned slippers inside a heavy pair of boots. Lotus 88 was not only the first car with this technology but among the first few cars to have most of the parts built with carbon fiber. It passed technical scrutiny in Long Beach for the 1981 championship and by the rule book, it was legal. But success always draws fear. The car was undoubtedly an engineering marvel, but the moment it rolled into the paddock, rival teams were scared. What if this worked? If this machine delivered what Chapman promised, every other team was obsolete. Frank Williams made his objection to the car clear, but he also hinted at the political opposition from some of the team who did not want to copy another of Chapman's breakthroughs. He said, and I quote, if it is accepted as legal finally, then we shall all have to build similar cars to remain competitive, and the costs will be enormous. Fearing Chapman would move the goalpost once again, rival teams protested that the 88 second chassis was merely a disguised movable aerodynamic device. And the politics of F1 showed their true colors. The FIA waited. Then, just like that, they black flagged the 88. Chapman didn't blink. He returned to Silverstone, the home race of Lotus, with the refined 88B. This time, the RAC gave it the green light, but FIA threatened them to strip the race of its world championship status if the car was allowed to run. Under political pressure, the RAC gave in, and Lotus were betrayed on their home ground. The crowd wanted to see the car in action, but it was over. The rule book had won. FIA banned the car again and again justifying the safety concerns of the drivers. But who knows, maybe it was a neat little cover story to stop dragging everyone into an expensive arms race. Some would argue that the car was not refined. Possibly yes, some technical experts have shown concerns with the structural integrity and the unique spring mechanism. But no innovation starts perfect. There is no manual to follow. You build, you test, you refine. 
Though its true potential was never tested, the ET-8 was groundbreaking and transformative. Given time, these initial anxieties could have been addressed, perhaps even fix the porpoising issue that still haunts F1 today. Chapman's relentless push through lawsuits and protests could not bring his dream any closer to reality. The sport moved on because it always does. But for the 88, it was killed hours before the race. It wasn't banned purely because it was unsafe. It was banned because it modified everyone, walking the fine line between genius and threat and making the rule makers feel powerless. The 88 never raised a lap, but it shook the foundation of the motorsport. And that in itself is the most powerful testament of all.